This is figure 13.8 from the book, and this will help us understand this, the, the importance of these two reactions. Here are what we call the light reactions. Sunlight, the plant is absorbing through its chlorophyll. Sunlight, that energy is of sunlight through a variety of processes that we're not going to talk about, but I certainly love talking about them. We're not going to talk about them uh, here today. Um, through a series of processes generate energy and two types of energy. One is this thing called ATP or adenosine triphosphate. Now when I ask for a show of hands in classes, most people have heard of ATP before and they know it has something to do with energy, so that's pretty good. I like to think of ATP as the gasoline that keeps our cells moving. Um, ATP is an energy molecule. It's the way that energy is distributed throughout organisms throughout cells, so it's supplying the energy that makes chemical reactions go, whether those chemical reactions are for breaking something down or whether those chemical reactions are for building something up. But it's a form of energy and that's all you need to remember. ATP is being produced as a result of these light reactions. We also have NADPH being produced as well. This is a reducing molecule and you don't need to know what that is, but between the two of them, they are what's coming out of the light reactions and supplying energy to what we call the dark reactions or the carbon fixation reactions. It is these carbon fixation reactions that are taking CO2 and making sugars. This sugar here is C6H12O6, otherwise known as glucose. And it's these sugars then that form the skeleton for or the backbone for all the other macromolecules and cellular components that a cell needs to make. Obviously there are a lot of important and complex chemical processes involved in here and I don't expect you to know them or go through them and even this is probably getting into a little bit more detail than you need to know but as long as you understand that the light reactions produce energy, they're taking light energy and turning it into chemical energy and then that the dark reactions are taking the chemical energy from the light reactions and fixing carbon dioxide into sugars. If you get that much then you're on your way to understanding this process fully. Now there's two other things I want to point to. One is you will notice over here we have a water molecule and that water molecule is being transformed into oxygen. Well, as it turns out, and also uh, this is something that many people have a misconception about, the oxygen that's produced as a result of photosynthesis comes from water. In fact, in the light reactions, an electron is stolen from water. We call that splitting water. So as part of these reactions that produce ATP and NADPH, water is split apart, an electron is stolen from water, that electron then actually goes through something like a mousetrap. If you've ever played that game mousetrap where the ball runs down and it kicks off various different things and eventually it hits something that makes a mousetrap go on the mouse and everybody yells, mousetrap. Electron transport chains are kind of like that. And the electron that's stolen from water goes through a series of electron transport chains. And as it's going sort of downhill, so to speak, just in the same way that ball in the mousetrap is going downhill, it's generating energy in the form of ATP and NADPH. And as a result of that process, because we've stolen an electron from water, the end product or a byproduct of the light reactions is oxygen. So the oxygen we breathe, the oxygen in the air, and the oxygen that's produced as part of photosynthesis comes from water. Now down here you'll see CO2 and a lot of people think that the that what's happening in photosynthesis is the CO2 is being broken apart and that's the oxygen, but that's not true. These carbon dioxide molecules are actually strung together in the Calvin-Benson cycle and out comes C6H12O6. So we actually have some oxygens in here as well and that's where those oxygens end up. So different fate for different molecules, light reactions are producing oxygen, carbon fixation reactions end up fixing carbon dioxide into sugar. Now I want you to pay attention to these two important parts and, and the difference between th these two because when we measure photosynthesis, 
the most common way to do it is either to look at oxygen being produced, in which case what we're largely looking at are the light reactions, and in the other technique, which is using radioactive carbon and looking at its fate and looking at its absorption and incorporation into cells, we're actually looking at the carbon fixation reactions. Now these two reactions do depend upon each other and these two reactions do interact, but they're not completely integrated and they're not, they don't occur in necessarily a one-to-one -one correspondence. In fact, some plants actually wait, they build up this energy, and later on in the dark, they actually fix their carbon. And those are some details we don't need to get into. But just remember, the oxygen comes from the light reactions, carbon dioxide is going in through the dark reactions, and that'll help you perhaps in a way that you really don't need to understand that level of detail, but it will help you understand the basis for the two major techniques for measuring primary production in the ocean, that is light, uh, oxygen production and carbon fixation. Okay, if we just simplify this incredibly, perhaps horrendously, we get the following equation. This is an equation that you see in your biology book and your biology teachers teach you. Carbon dioxide plus water, and we know that water is necessary for the light reactions, plus light, makes sugars, and this is sort of the basic backbone formula for sugars, CH2O, N, and water and oxygen as a byproduct. So carbon dioxide and water in the presence of light go to sugars and more water and oxygen. That's the familiar equation of photosynthesis, and that's the one that most of you have learned. Now, we can Add a little oceanographic touch to it, and don't be alarmed, I'm not going to ask you to, to recite this, but it's important just again for giving you some context about why oceanographers measure certain things in relation to productivity. But if we look at what are called redfield ratios, and redfield ratios are a topic discussed briefly in chapter um, 6 in the book, but we are essentially adding the important biologically important nutrients. And we did talk about those in uh, chapter six. So here's an equation of photosynthesis in which we've added nitrogen and phosphorus, which we know to be required by phytoplankton and plants, and in their proper proportions, which are called redfield ratios. So here we have carbon dioxide, water, nitrate, phosphate, plus light goes to sugars and ammonia and phosphate and oxygen as a result. Now, again, I don't expect you to understand this, but I do want to make one important point. If we remove light, so put a big X through here, how fast is photosynthesis? If you said zero, that's right. Without light, we don't have photosynthesis. By the same token, if we take out the nitrate and phosphate, so we just remove these and don't make them available to the phytoplankton of the plant, we also don't have any photosynthesis. And so when we come back and look at the biological, the physical chemical controls on, photos, on photosynthesis, on primary production, we want to remember no light, no photosynthesis, no nutrients, no photosynthesis, and this equation gives us some basis for understanding that.